Oke, okay. ya. Ah, hello, sir. Uh, yes, hello, sir. I, got, I got cut out, so I'll just share and let us see if it works. Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Mm, mm, not yet, sir. Uh, now it's... Yes, sir. Yes. Is it visible? Yeah, it so is it visible, says, sir. So, introduction to robotics and AI, that's visible, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you okay. can. Okay, okay, okay. 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 okay, so sorry, we got cut out. I got cut out some, for some reason. Anyway, it's a learning experience for everybody. Okay, so I'll very briefly talk about introduction to robotics and AI, uh, the past, present, and future. Okay, so the first question that would come to everybody's mind. Uh, who are not really associated with robotics and a lot of you sitting here today and listening to this talk is that what do you have to do with robotics okay so why should you study robotics what is there in robotics and uh, wh why should you be interested in the first place so what i'll try and do is try and uh, uh, try and convince you that robotics is very much a part of our lives today they may not be visible here and there but robotics in terms of the hardware in terms of software is available and they are everywhere and they are in, we are interacting with them continuously, although you may not be aware. So that's what I'll try and do in this inauguration uh, talk. So today's talk, basically, I'll talk about the history of automation, robotics, and uh, AI, because this is a term that is used uh, very commonly today, and directions of research in future. OK? So all of you sitting today, when you hear the word robot, so what comes to your mind when you first hear the word robot? So for different people, different thing comes to your mind. For example, for some people, uh, robots would be basically mechanical machines, okay, like uh, machines working in industries. Uh, for younger uh, people, it could be companions, friends. Okay, it could be uh, toys and pets, could be helpers, or it could be dangerous machines. Like we have a lot of examples of them today in the, for uh, defense applications. Okay, but the interesting part is, if you hear this word uh, robot, something will come to your mind. Okay, and normally it is one of these uh, uh, four or five things. OK, so it is not that you'll very rarely find somebody who has never heard about a robot. OK, if you say robot, they'll think of something. Now, uh, uh, that shows that this word robot is very, very commonly used in our everyday lives today. Now, the past, where did robots come from? Or, sorry, what, were the, what is the past of robotics? Now, robotics essentially started off in, in the industries for doing applications like spot welding, spray painting, pick and place applications. Like this is. Uh, uh, spot welding application in industrial uh, automobiles, which is the most common even today. Now, from 1960s to today, this is probably industrial robotics, what we mean by robots, what they're doing in industries. Now, uh, that is the past. What about now? Now, where robotics is, is essentially in factory automation, warehousing, Amazon robotics. So if you look at uh, Amazon or the way Flipkart and Amazon works, when you give an order on, uh, on Amazon, you're sitting on your computer, on your mobile phone, and you're placing an order. Now, this order is going to the Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon factory, where a part is being picked up, and then it is being delivered to you. So how does this work? So if you look at this video, so there are these uh, warehouses, large warehouses, where parts are, are kept on various uh, shelves and cartoons. And once you give an order, what happens is the particular robot will go to that particular place, pick up the, pick up that particular part, come and give it to delivery, and it is dispatched to you. Okay. Now, if you see how many robots, how big are these uh, warehouses? Well, they are very, very large. How many robots are working? About 3,000 or more. Okay. So these are basically mobile robots uh, going from place to place, picking up something, and then delivering it to you. Okay. So if you look at uh, in terms of research, in terms of planning, in terms of management. This is a big challenge, right from designing such robots to driving to control to AI, uh, having some kind of intelligence. Now, if there are 3,000 robots working together, then it's a very, very complex, pro uh, very, very complex problem. Okay, so this is essentially to show you. 
So if you look at uh, the number of robots here, 3,000 robots going like this, there are multiple solutions, there are multiple networks, okay? The robot has to be optimal, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and then... Sir, yeah, um, so sorry to um, uh, interrupt. Um, uh, are you changing the slide, sir? Or, uh, because still we are seeing the oh, first yeah. slide. Okay, the slide change is not taking place there. Yeah, it seems like that, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. So, yeah, the slide is not changing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, what do we do with that? Uh, sir, uh, this is Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, one suggestion. Hmm. Uh, what you can do is uh, uh, you can upload your presentation, sir. Uh, there is a plus symbol here at the bottom. Ah, now it's uh, changing, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I see social robots. Now it is changing. Yeah, yes, now it's, it's changing. Now. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So it is not taking okay. the other part. Okay, okay. So Thank I'll you. just. Thank you. Okay. So what I was trying to talk about is that uh, the past of robotics. Okay. So now here, uh, I'll just go through it very quickly. Then, uh, what I was just talking a few minutes back. So uh, this slide is visible, right? What comes to your mind when you hear the word robot, right? This is visible to you, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So, uh, what I'm trying to explain is that if you talk about the word robot, something comes to your mind. It can be a mechanical machine, it can be a companion, it can be a toy pet helper or something. Okay, but something would come to your mind. Now, if you look at the past, the past is basically industrial robotics, where robots were doing tasks in industries. Okay, so this is an example of industrial robot doing spot welding in uh, uh, in automobile industries. Okay. Now, this is something that comes to your mind very commonly when you think about the word robot or what uh, what we mean by industrial robot. Okay. But now, if you proceed a little further and we come to our present situation, then essentially it is warehouse automation like in uh, uh, in Amazon or in Flipkart. So if you look at uh, the warehouse warehouses of uh, Amazon, when you place an order on Amazon, the uh, you place the order on your mobile phone or on uh, on your laptop or on PC and the order goes to the warehouse where the part is picked up and the part is then dispatched to you okay so you may think that you have nothing to do with robotics but most of you have or rather all of you would have uh, ordered something on uh, amazon and so there is a robot which is there somewhere which is interacting with you may not be directly but could be virtually okay so this is the second uh, application there uh, of today where we have factory automation where robots are used extensively in factories in social uh, in uh, this kind of uh, warehousing sites okay now this is an example just to show you that you may think you have nothing to do with a robot but you actually have something to do with a robot if not directly then indirectly okay because in amazon uh, there are robots which are actually doing uh, stuff everywhere so this is where we are at present okay the past was industrial robotics now we are in uh, uh, this uh, robotics which is basically for warehousing uh, retails etc now what about the future as we are going towards the future the future is basically show, uh, social robotics where robots are actually coming into society okay now we have things called uh, clones we have uh, teachers we have androids we have guides now these are pictures which are there already for example the picture on the center if you look this is basically a gentleman has made his own clone so you don't know which is the robot and which is the human actually okay now on the right side here okay there is uh, uh, this is basically a teacher or teaching robot okay so even teachers in kindergartens and there are robots which are designed at teachers to interact with uh, kids in kindergarten okay and there are social robots which are there in uh, in hospitals for example today because of the pandemic a lot of robots are being used in airports for showing directions so robots are already there in society so what i'm trying to tell you or what i'm trying to convince you is that essentially we are interacting with robots in uh, in many ways okay without un without knowing or being aware that actually that's a robot on the other side Okay. Now, a teacher as a robot, maybe in another 20 years or 30 years, this is today. Okay. How do you know whether I'm a robot or I'm a human? Okay. You don't know, actually. Okay. This could be a recorded lecture. I may not be here. Okay. Or I, myself, could be a, a software program or a bot, which is actually presenting this lecture to you. How do you know I'm a human? Well, you don't know. How do you prove it? Okay, that is something in the direction of AI again. Okay. So this is the direction in which we are going from industries to social robotics to uh, retail robotics and the future of robotics. 
Okay. So if you think that you have nothing to do with robotics, please think again. Okay. You have something to do with robotics and it is it includes everything and everybody. Not only engineering, engineering, of course, computer science, mechanical, electrical, uh, then uh, other uh, other aerospace. Okay. But even disciplines which are non-engineering, for example, uh, social society, sociology, humanities, English. Okay. So when robots are living in society, what effect do they have? So that is the kind of studies being done by sociologists. Legal, you might worry about uh, what does legal have to do with this? Yes, even for legal. Okay. For example, if a human, uh, if a robot uh, uh, harms a human, then who's responsible? What are the legal laws? So robotics includes not only engineering, it includes sociology, it includes um, humanities, it includes medical, it includes everybody today. Okay. That is something I'm trying to convince you that there is something for everybody in this topic today. Okay. You just have to find what is your focus of interest. Now, some very funny questions because there are social robots today. For example, a very funny question that has come up today is that uh, if you want to buy a robot, or what will be the gender of the robot? Would it be male, female? Would it be neutral? You might say this question has no meaning, okay, but it does have meaning. If you're going to buy a robot, what will be the gender? Okay. Now, a more interesting question for us as we talk about things like AI today is, uh, if you're buying a robot or a machine, is this machine intelligent? Just some time back, I said that I'm speaking to you. Am I a human or am I a robot? How do you know? Okay. Now, if you don't know, then there's a very bad, uh, I, I think uh, uh, human beings are doomed. If you cannot make out whether it's a machine or it's a human. Now, if it's a machine, is it intelligent? How do you know again if a machine is intelligent? So these are questions which have come up, okay, from dumb industrial machines to intelligent machines. Okay, so today I'll talk about a uh, little bit about robotics, a little bit about intelligence. Okay, can you make out if it's a human? It's not a human. How do you know? Okay, so these are some things which are very strange, but they are there today. So let's proceed. So I'll very briefly go about the origin of robotics. So robotics is a basic sub-discipline of the topic of uh, automation. And automation essentially means replacing human muscular power. Okay, so uh, there is office automation, there is home automation, there's industrial automation. Automation is essentially replacing human muscular power. And this business of automation has been going on for thousands of years. It's not like somebody invented automation one day and then uh, suddenly we had automation from that day. It's not like that. Right from 10,000 BC, human beings made uh, uh, tools, different kinds of tools. You know, uh, we have stone tools, then we have iron tools, copper tools in that order. So tools make better tools. Now we have NCs, CNC, DNC, FMS in terms of machines. They are basically tools, but tools are making better tools, and that is how civilization is progressing. So this process has been going on and on and on. Okay. And uh, the uh, uh, the uh, there are a lot of examples. For example, design of simple automation goes back to about 150 BC. For example, here, this is an example of a steam engine. On the left-hand side, when you look at this, uh, this is a, a, a container containing water where they would, uh, uh, they would uh, burn fire and produce steam. And the steam would come out from these two directions on this hemisphere. Okay. Now, because the steam is coming out in these two directions, okay, uh, what will happen? There will be a resultant moment about the central axis, and this will rotate. So this is the simplest example of a steam engine. Okay. It is not James Watt who invented the steam engine. The steam engine was there for a very long time. Okay. He just used it. Now, uh, if you look at the date, 150 BC, okay, this is even uh, thousands, 2,000 years ago that these things were there. Automatic opening and closing of doors. Again, same principle. They would burn fire, and the fire would increase the pressure. The pressure would uh, force the water to go into the bucket. On the uh, on the example on the right hand side, okay. And uh, when the water goes into this bucket, its ma its weight will increase, so it will come down. The pulley will rotate, and the door will open. So this is automation. Why automation? Because no muscular power. What what is the year? 150 BC. So automation was there for a very long time. It's not like that. It suddenly came about sometime. Uh, I mean, uh, in the recent past. Now, that is 150 BC. About 1800, we saw the creation of automatic dolls, which could write, draw pictures. Then in 1800, we see further this gentleman called J uh, James Jacquard. He invented the uh, programmed textile mill or the textile uh, loom. So when we make cloth even today, they use a, a, a cloth textile loom, where which is manually controlled. So when you have cloth being made, there are these threads which go through, right? You would have seen this mill, this kind of uh, power looms or manual looms. So they make various designs. And how do they make these designs? They make the design by changing the position of this thread. So if the base is white in color and they want to make a design of uh, black, then they will take this black thread and move it around. 
and uh, this is going to make the design on cloth. This is how the power loom works. So this gentleman in France invented uh, a program or a machine which could be programmed, and the program was written in the form of a punch card. Okay, so this is the earliest example of a punch card, which we also have today as an OMR sheet. So essentially, in NC codes also, we have this uh, hole and no hole. Today, you're familiar with this OMR sheets. So uh, you either leave it blank or you make it uh, or you darken it, and a machine can read it, right? So this is the earliest example of a programmed uh, of a program which could run a machine, and the earliest example of a punch card. The earlier computers and machines all use punch cards. Today we don't use them anymore, but uh, today we we do use OMR sheets. So again, it goes back to 1800, okay, nearly 200 years ago, where this was invented. Now, as we go further, we see that the idea of a transfer line, where cars are assembled in the, uh, in an industry, came about in 1904 in the Ford Motor Company, where a car would move on a transfer line, and at different positions, different parts would be installed onto the car. Even today is the same. So the vehicle is kept on the transfer line, it moves from point to point, and at every station, a human being or a robot does something. Now, just for historical interest, okay, the word robot essentially came about in 1921, in uh, where this gentleman Carl Capek wrote a play depicting human-like mechanical men, so as shown in this figure. So he said that in future, there are going to be mechanical men who are going to replace human beings to do dirty jobs in industries. And the word robot essentially means mechanical men or slave men in a Czechoslovakian language. Of course, 1921, there are no robots. 1942, Isaac Asimov first used the word robotics. And he said in future, there will be a subject called robotics and uh, the three laws of robotics. And he wrote a lot of uh, movies. There are a lot of movies today. I, Robot is one. Okay, uh, I would uh, encourage you to see it. It's very interesting. It's interesting because 1942, there was no robot. But this gentleman could imagine that in future, there will be something like this. And uh, he has written actually 200 years from now. Okay, that in, in the future 200 years, what is going to happen? That he said robots will become intelligent. He talks also about AI. The robots will become so intelligent that at some point they may take over human beings. Okay, that's very interesting. So uh, a person could actually imagine, and we are going in that direction, and a lot of the things are actually coming true. Of course, I hope the last thing that robots take over doesn't happen, but uh, we need to understand this business of AI and how intelligence is increasing and things like that. So till 1942, these words were used, uh, robotics was used, but there was no robot. So the robot essentially came about, about in 1945 with the master slave manipulator in the Second World War. So in this master slave manipulator, basically this is a mechanical device for handling radioactive material. So they would put the radioactive material on the slave side and there would be very heavy shielding in between, okay, maybe a wall of six uh, meters. Okay? And there'll be a very small window through which they can see. So the master would stand here Okay, and the master would hold the, uh, the master arm, the operator would hold the arm and then move it. For example, he pulls it this side. So the arm will come like that. Now, every joint here is connected by wire rope and pulley that you can see. So the wire rope is connected here, it goes this side, goes this side, goes to the corresponding joint. So if you, uh, uh, if you pull it on this side, what will happen? The tension will change and this arm will go this side. That's how it works. But this is essentially a mechanical device. There is no program, there is no controller here. This is the father of the robot, and 1945, uh, the master slave manipulator was made. Even today, it is used. Okay. Now, 1945, 1948-49, something happened. We changed uh, mechanical engineering to electromechanical engineering. We also call it mechatronics. And now, what happened 1948-49 is the invention of the transistor. The moment the transistor came, you could have the concept of a reprogram. So you could have a microcontroller, controller, computer, and the concept of reprogram came. 1949. So everything before this time was not programmable. This business of program came somewhere around 1949 only with the transistor. And the first robot came about 1950. 1952 is uh, George and Playback, uh, uh, George Dovell with his NC machines. Okay. So the concept of robot essentially came from this electromechanical systems where you could have a program which is controlling a mechanical system. Where you, you change the program, the system will change. Okay, and that is the birth of the robot, 1950. So 1950 to 19 uh, to today, uh, it's not very, uh, it's not very, uh, only 50, 60 years. Okay, but it has moved from a very simple device to a very complex device. Okay, so the invention basically came about with the invention of the transistor. Now, uh, as the computer became more and more powerful, okay, we had one machine controlling 
one computer controlling one machine, then we had one computer controlling many machines, and this is our evolution of NC to CNC to SIM to FMS in that order. Essentially, the computer is becoming more and more powerful. It's becoming smaller and becoming powerful, becoming cheaper. Okay. Now, what is the definition of a robot? Now, nobody seems to agree on this. Why? Because everybody would like to say what they are doing is robotics or industries would like to say that what they are inventing is a robot. So in general, it's understood that if a system moves around, it senses and manipulates the environment or displays intelligent behavior, either of this or all of this, then you can call it a robot. Okay. So this is the basic accepted definition. So a vacuum cleaner, which can move around and, uh, uh, and clean the room by itself, has some kind of intelligent behavior. So it can be called a robot. Okay. So this is basically understood as of today. Now, uh, as the computer became smaller, we have the second generation uh, or the second greatest invention, which is VLSI. Okay, now, VLSI essentially is very large scale integrated circuits about 1970s and because of which we could make everything on one board okay, and electronics became smaller, faster and cheaper. Okay. So the first great industrial revolution was the invention of the transistor. The second is electronics becoming smaller, faster, cheaper because of which we have uh, electronics which has become small, fast, cheap, and they could be used for different applications. You know today that you can buy a webcam for maybe a few hundred rupees. You can buy a computer mouse for 150 rupees. That is because electronics is small, fast, and cheap. And that is essentially because of VLSI. Okay. So from 1970s, we have these new subjects coming up, vision, uh, advanced sensors, gyros, advanced controllers, microcontrollers, DSPs, FPGAs, speech recognition, AI. Okay, so this about came about 1970s. Okay, and that is because of electronics becoming smaller, faster, and cheaper. The third great revolution that came about was new materials. This is about 1990s, 1990s onwards. So it is new materials, which is smart materials, smart actuators, which changed that we could go into the smaller domain, which is the micro domain or the nano domain. Now, you cannot take a DC motor and make it very small. Why? Because it won't work anymore. Okay, the torque will not be sufficient. So you cannot use a conventional actuator sensor in the micro or the nano domains. So in this domain, you have to use actuator sensors which are made of different materials. And these are called smart materials, uh, which are independent of uh, size. Okay. So we have these three generations, uh, transistor. Uh, then we had uh, the second generation, which is VLSI. The third generation is new materials, smart materials, smart actuators, smart sensors. So this is the direction in which robotics or I would say automation has moved. Now, where are we today? We are at a stage where we have very small uh, robots. How small is small? Say, for example, robots which can go inside the blood vessel. We are at that scale today uh, for doing a heart surgery. Okay, so this is a robot which can go inside the blood vessel, uh, do heart surgery. Already stents in the heart are being placed with uh, robots which can enter through the hand or through the veins in the legs. Okay, so that is the scale we are in. Some funny things like dentist. Okay, then a haircut. These are all funny things. Okay, but they are there. Uh, this is an example of uh, artificial muscle uh, based actuator. So we have uh, a hand. There is no linkage you can see here, but it's behaving like a hand. Okay, so there is no linkage. There is no actuator. There is no sensor. But this is a smart material base that if you give it a particular voltage, it moves in a particular direction. Okay, this is what I meant by a smart material. And you can make very small devices with this. Okay, so these are uh, electroactive polymers. Okay, for example, this is another example where uh, we have uh, a snake or a bird which is made up of an electroactive polymer. Then we have uh, exoskeletons. Okay, these are some of the examples of uh, robotics which is not only related to the industrial robotics but has come right into society. Exoskeletons which can you know, automatic transport, which is there. So these are buses which uh, come and stop in particular locations. People get up, get down, and uh, they move to. Uh, the next position, there is no driver. So this is autonomous transport. This is already there. Okay. Uh, very funny things like people are studying about happy behavior, happy robot, sad robot. Then we have uh, brain computer interfaces okay, for robotics, uh, automatic uh, road tracking, autonomous vehicles. You would have heard about it, Google cars, okay, where they're trying to uh, make autonomous cars, which can follow, follow roads and drive by itself. Then we have uh, ethics and laws. Okay, so driver tracking is another one. Okay, so this is basically to show you that the area of robotics is not only confined to industries and industrial robotics, but there is something for everybody, whether you're computer science or you're mechanical engineering or electrical or you are uh, not even engineering. If you're humanities, your social sciences, you're legal. Okay, 
and uh, uh, maybe English language. Okay, people are trying to look at English language. How does a machine understand language? How would it speak? For example, Google has Alexa today. Okay, you have Alexa where it speaks to you. Your computer laptops also speak to you. That is, uh, speech recognition software is there. So it is encompassing everything today. Okay, now as we move forward, uh, ethics and laws. This is uh, something which has come about very recently. Okay, that uh, what should be the laws governing robots? Should there be laws? There should be no laws. For example, in an industry, there's an accident. Now, who's responsible? The human who caused the accident or the robot caused the accident? Okay, then who pays for damages? These questions were not there before, but they are there today. Okay. Now, if you look at Industry 4.0, essentially, industry, the first industrial revolution was basically uh, mechanization, which is driven by steam power or water power. Okay, that is very, very long time ago. So maybe 1700 and before. It is basically the driving power which is steam power or water power, that is your industry uh, 1.0. Okay. In 2.0 is basically mass production. We have assembly lines and it is driven by electricity. So this is the industrial revolution of, uh, of uh, in uh, England. Okay, so 19, 1870s and things like that, where we have mass production, but the driving power is uh, by electricity. Okay, and there are actuators. Now 1970s is what we have our IT revolution in India. And that is basically computer-based automation. Okay, this is what we call IT in India. Okay. Now, if you go a little bit further, for about 2000 onwards, we have the fourth industrial revolution, which are basically called cyber physical systems or industry 4.0. Now, the basic difference is that we have a computer, we have automation, but we have humans in the loop now, and there is some AI. Okay. So in this uh, industry 3.0, you have computers, you have machines, but there is no human, there is no AI as such. But in industry 4.0, we have machines, we have computers, but there is a human in the loop and there is some amount of AI involved. Okay. There can be a robot. Very simple example is your Ola cabs and your Uber cabs, okay, where you are actually uh, dialing for a cab with your mobile phone. Okay. That uh, is going into a virtual world, which is doing the planning and seeing which taxi is where. And then it is selecting a car and then giving, coming back to the real world and then it's coming to you. Okay, that is the, why there is a, this word cyber physical system is also used. So we are here today, okay, where there is a machine, can be a robot, there can be a computer, there is intelligent software, and there is some amount of AI, and there is a human. Okay, so this is the direction in which industries have progressed, and this is where we are today. Now, uh, uh, the future, the future is essentially industrial uh, robotics, where the robot and the human works together. That is one. The second is in terms of AI. We want to have machines which are intelligent. Okay, now when I say a machine, when I say a robot, please note that I don't mean only a hardware which is a robot. A software or a bot is also a robot. Okay, it need not be a hard robot, it can be a soft robot also, which is basically a software which is doing something somewhere. Okay, so robotics also includes the soft part today. Okay, it could be a virtual speaker, for example, a virtual chatbot, but that's also a robot. Now, in terms of robotics, the industrial uh, rules as of today say that the human worker should be on one side and the robot should be on the other side. And there is a safety barrier which is in between both of this. Okay, So for safety reason, the human and the robot never come on the same work area Okay, because uh, it is dangerous. So in future, it is expected that we should make robots which are safe. What kind of safe robots? This is an example. Robots which can work with humans. They will not hit robot. Uh, they will not, even if they hit the human, it will not be dangerous. So if you look at this, so these are robots which are safe. If it, it can be programmed by simply holding and moving it. If it hits somebody, it should be safe. Okay. So this kind of robots, which are, so these robots are designed in a way which is different from our industrial robots. They may not be using the standard actuators, the, the standard controllers. Okay, they could be using some other kind of uh, structure, okay, which will make them safe. Now, another term which is used very commonly is uh, AI. We are seeing that in future machines should have intelligence. Now, what is this intelligence? Okay, now a question I asked some time back is that uh, we have robots in society. How do you know that I'm a robot or I'm a human? I'm speaking to you today. Who am I? Okay, how do you know? I could simply put my picture there and there could be a software which is actually controlling everything okay so this business of artificial intelligence is something which is becoming uh, important today so i'll speak very shortly just five ten minutes about it and then i will stop 
So machines are supposed to be intelligent. And uh, intelligent machine, again, would basically mean a machine which can work by itself, can sense the environment, can walk around. So this is a robot which can, uh, which can map the environment in 3D. It can take decisions. Okay, if it falls down, it can get up like a human being. So we say this is intelligent. Okay, but then what is intelligence or what is AI? Because we are trying to say that machines should be intelligent. Okay, so let's look at uh, a little bit into this, what we mean by AI or what we mean by intelligence. There are a lot of applications. For example, there are already devices which are supposed to be intelligent, which are all around. Again, you might have interacted with some of them. For example, automatic vacuum cleaners. Okay, they're there in India also. Automatic floor cleaners, okay, robotic window cleaners, sweeping robots, uh, toy robots, which are some amount of intelligence. And again, all manufacturers claim that their machine is intelligent. Okay, all students like to make machines which are intelligent. Okay, why it is in it is in uh, it, it's in vogue to say that okay, I'm working in AI. Okay, my I'm doing research in AI. But then we should understand what is this AI. Okay, so in movies again, those of you who like movies. Uh, can see some of the movies, for example, Star Wars is one, Terminator is there, okay, iRobot, uh, Isaac Asimov, interesting movies, okay, and uh, they are very interesting because sometime in future they might become reality, okay. Now, uh, there are most of the companies which are working, so uh, Google, Yahoo, most of the search engines then uh, are already on it in a big way, okay, space robots, okay, but then uh, why are we interested in this intelligence and what is this intelligence in the first place? Okay, now what is AI? Very briefly, AI basically develops systems that can think like humans. Okay, and systems that can act like humans. Okay, so this is fundamental to systems. I'm, I'm, I'm more or less in the area of robotics. So systems are, that can think like a human or a machine that can think, uh, that can act like a human. Okay, which essentially means systems that can think rationally or systems that can act rationally. Okay. Uh, now, if you look at this topic of AI, AI is not only limited to, AI is also very, very old, okay, right from the time of Aristotle and others. So AI includes a lot of other topics, for example, philosophy, mathematics, uh, economics. Then we have neuroscience, psychology, okay, computer science, control theory, linguistics, robotics, everything is included. Although we are talking only about robotics part. But just to know that AI actually is a field in itself and everything is included there and it has a very, very old history. We are simply trying to answer the question of uh, what is AI in terms of robotics? Okay, so what is AI is essentially the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. In our case, intelligent robots or making intelligent computer programs. Okay, now, but then what is intelligence? So intelligence is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. Okay, so we're trying to say that intelligence has to do something with uh, uh, the computational ability to make decisions like a human. Now, is there a solid definition of intelligence? Okay, uh, that doesn't depend relating it to humans. Well, not as yet. Okay, we actually do not have any definition as of today. Now, this is a very interesting question. We know that a system which is intelligent has to interact with the real world. It must have this uh, attributes. It must have some kind of reasoning and planning. It must be able to learn and adapt to the world. Okay. Now, if you're trying to say that a machine can think, okay, then this question actually comes out, which was basically posed by uh, Alan Turing uh, in his famous paper, 1950s in computing machinery, is can a machine think? Now, please look at this, uh, please uh, view this movie, Imitation Games. I'm telling you to watch a lot of movies, okay? I tell that in my class also to the students, which I think a student, uh, teacher shouldn't tell the students to watch movies. But movies are a very, very nice way of understanding the direction of things like AI robotics. Please watch this movie, Imitation Games. It is basically about Alan Turing and his uh, machine. Okay. So in this uh, paper, he basically talks about can machines think? And he tries to answer this very simple question that if machines can think, okay, how can you make out that a machine can actually think? Okay, so if you can answer this question, the question that I asked some time back, am I a robot? Am I a human? How do you know? Okay, so we are saying that if I'm a human, I should have some intelligence. And if I can make an intelligent machine, it should be able to fool you to believing that it's a, uh, that it, it is a human. Okay, so this was first proposed by Alan Turing uh, in his famous uh, paper, where he tried to ask this question, can machines think? Because it is related to intelligence. And if you're saying intelligence, then it is related to human beings. 
Okay, but when he asked this question, can men, uh, machines think? He uh, he understood that there is a bigger problem here. Now the bigger problem is how would you know that um, if a, if somebody says this machine can think, how can you prove or disprove that the machine can think or it cannot think? So one way he tried to figure out is that he tried to make a test called the Turing test. That uh, so the Turing test is something like this: if you can make an intelligent machine which can fool a human into believing that it is a it is a human being then you have succeeded okay so i'll repeat what i said suppose you make an intelligent machine which can fool other humans into believing that it is a human being then uh, it is intelligent okay so what is the turing test it is something like this so there is a machine intelligent machine which is here and there is a human being which is sitting here so these are cubicles and nobody can see each other so they are completely uh, they are not visible to each other so there is a machine which is supposed to be an intelligent machine here Okay, it can be a robot, it can be a computer program, and there is a human being on the other side sitting here, and on the other side there is an uh, interrogator which is, who is sitting here, okay. and these three communicate with each other by using a keyboard, not by speaking. Okay, so the human being who, interrogator who is sitting here will ask questions to the machine and to the human, but he doesn't know which is the machine and which is the human, and the machine and the human has to try and fool the interrogator into believing that uh, it is a human. Now, if a machine can do that, then we may believe that it is intelligent. Okay, we have got only that far. Beyond that, we don't know what is intelligent. We cannot define it. Okay, so this is basically called the Turing test, where you're trying to fool, uh, where a machine is intelligent if it can fool a human interrogator that uh, it is a machine. No, sorry, it's a human. Okay, now uh, this brings us to the topic of weak AI and strong AI. So machines that can be made to act as if they were intelligent and machines that act intelligently and have conscious minds. So this is becoming philosophical that we are talking of conscious minds and minds now. OK, so this discussion about intelligent machines actually very quickly goes into philosophy. OK, and you start talking about minds. Can you have minds? Can a machine have mind? But Alan Turing was the first person who actually thought about this, that if you're saying a machine is intelligent, how do you know it is intelligent? And he suggested this test that maybe if the machine can fool you into believing that it's a human being, then it has passed the test. Okay. Now, how is it relevant to what we are talking? Okay. Now, uh, there is also a fallacy here. Okay. Uh, very interesting uh, fallacy here is that, for example, this Chinese room paradox is suppose there is a room like this, and the person inside the room does not know Chinese, but the person has a, a guide which has exact translation of Chinese. So something like this. Now, what is this uh, sales paradox? It is basically a person from the outside on the left-hand side, and there is a person out, which is on the right-hand side. So the person on the left-hand side will give a question in Chinese, will drop a question in Chinese inside the room. The person inside the room will pick up this question, which is in Chinese. He doesn't know Chinese. He will simply refer to that manual and write the answer and give it out to the person outside. Okay. So the manual is something like this. So if you see the shape, okay, followed by this shape, followed by this shape, then you produce this shape and this shape, okay? So the fellow inside must only look at the manual and just keep translating, okay? Why bring this up here? Now, this is because of the concept of weak AI that to the person standing outside, it would appear that the fellow standing inside actually understands Chinese, but it's really not the fact. The person doesn't understand. Okay, so this brings us to the other question of understanding. Okay, what is understanding? Okay, so that is the concept of weak AI and strong AI. So people believe that computers can never understand. They may be very fast at doing something, but they don't really understand what they are doing. Okay, they are doing something like this. Now, where does this bring us to, uh, or uh, what is this discussion, and how does it include you and robotics? Okay, you are familiar with this word captcha. Most of you use this captcha. Uh, when you log into maybe email sites or uh, websites, okay, in banking sites, when you enter your password and uh, uh, and your login ID, it basically asks you something like this: Please enter these words in the window. And only when you enter correctly, okay, it allows you to log in. So the capture can be a word like this, or it can be figures like this, or it can be pictures like this. Okay, so this is called a captcha. And uh, uh, what is a captcha? A CAPTCHA is essentially an auto, a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. So this CAPTCHA is essentially a Turing test 
Now, what I talked about some time back is a Turing test. It is a machine which is trying to make out if you are a human now and you are being subjected to it. Okay, so it is not like AI is floating around, you have nothing to do with it. I was just trying to convince you that robotics is something which is very much embedded now. It's there everywhere. Similarly, this business of AI is everywhere. Okay, so this is a machine which is actually trying to make out if you are a human and you're not a computer program. Okay, so because a computer program would find it very difficult to figure this out. Okay, and uh, it is called a uh, completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Okay, and we are being subjected to it almost every day uh, in various forms. And this is basically checking if you are a, a machine, if you are a machine or are you a human. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, chatterbots. Whenever you go online and chat, now is that a human? Is that a human? Is that uh, is that a machine? It's a software program. Okay. Similarly, for a robot, we we need to know if a robot is intelligent. How do you make out if a robot is intelligent or not intelligent? So in this chat, in, when you chat, I'm sure all of you would have chatted with some online program. Very quickly, you can make out that it's a program. After some time, it will not be able to answer you anymore. Okay, because it's a software program. Okay, you can then you can make out that that's not a that's not a human. Okay, but we have not got very far as to be able to define intelligence uh, explicitly apart from this kind of Turing test. Okay, so when somebody says this is an intelligent machine, it's very difficult to say whether it's intelligent or not. At most, you can say, okay, it's not a human, it's a machine. Okay, and how much of intelligence? Now, in terms of robotics, uh, we are basically in the domain where we are uh, looking at intelligent robots. Why? Because you have applications like this. For example, the robot has to pass over this, uh, this quadruped has to pass over uh, these stones. Okay, now, uh, or let's look at this example where this uh, this is a factory inside and there's a humanoid robot which has to go inside and do some tasks. It should be able to map the world. It should be have some kind of intelligence to go from some place or do some task. So I'm using this word intelligence. But if somebody asks you very closely, what is this you're talking about? Uh, it's very difficult to say actually. It's behaving like a human. It's a system which behaves like a human. Okay, that's about it. And, but it's still a machine. Okay, now uh, where do we use it? Okay, for example, in applications such as this, okay, you have a look at this uh, application where we have a space rover, which is uh, moving, okay, from one pl one place to another place. Okay, now you can see that the terrain is extremely complex. Now, if you try and solve this problem by using our standard inverse kinematics, forward kinematics, our kinematics, okay, there'll be infinite solutions. Okay, so this uh, rover solution, if I draw the axis frames and do the inverse kinematics, then what would happen is I will end up with a relationship which is like this. So my, uh, the end effector position coordinates, X, Y, Z of the end effector of the R robot arm on the vehicle is related to the join coordinates by the Jacobian matrix. And the Jacobian matrix is 36 into 23. Okay, so which means that from the control point of view, if you want to control this robot, you have infinite solutions and you cannot do it in real time. Okay, so when we have problems like this, where real time solutions are not possible, we can try and go in for things like machine learning, try to go in for something like uh, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning basically, where what we do is we try and map the relationship. In this particular case, I'm mapping the relationship between the end effector trajectories. So the end effector X, Y, Z versus the joint coordinates there. So I learned this mapping and once I learn it, then I can come back and uh, perform whatever task I want. Okay. Now I can learn it by using things like uh, uh, neural net is one example. Support vector machine is another one. Reinforcement learning. These are all learning techniques. That's it. What they are doing is they are finding a relationship between the end effector task and the joint coordinates. Okay. Why? Because in such case, uh, there are infinite solutions and real time solution may not be possible. Okay. So these are some examples of uh, uh, of machine learning applications in robotics. So today I don't have too much time so uh, to be able to. So automatic cars, space robots, industrial robots, where we have uh, problems of uh, uh, where we have problems of not being able to control in real time. Okay, we can go in for some kind of learning. So this is basically where you go in. Another example is in automatic uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles today, where car has to drive by itself. Okay, you can either go in for learning and try and make it uh, learn. This is an example of uh, driving a car. So I will just show this video and I will stop today. I think I've exceeded my time. So uh, 
this is a car in three dimensional uh, space which is uh, so this is a car which is uh, which has to learn to move in three dimensional terrain and follow a trajectory okay again those of you who have worked with mobile robots you would know that it only has one steering and one drive so there is two inputs but the but the vehicle has six degrees of freedom okay it has three translations three rotations so the mapping is two degrees uh, two actuators one steering and one uh, drive versus six outputs this side okay so if you have to learn this kind of uh, mapping between the actuator and the terrain and the terrain is three dimensional so it can go in any direction okay so now if you want this car to drive in a particular way one way of it could be to have some kind of a learning method where we can use what we can do is we can drive the car in different directions look at the relationship between the actuator input that steering angle input and the final joint output uh, sorry the final xyz output of the vehicle and once you have learned this mapping then what we can do is we can drive the vehicle in any kind of terrain okay. so these are examples of uh, uh, machine learning applications uh, where uh, in robotics where we can try and make a machine which is slightly intelligent in the sense that it can drive by itself okay where real time solutions may not be possible okay so i think i've exceeded my time so i'll stop here and uh, thank you for your uh, inviting me and listening to my talk thank you thank you sir um, that was very informative and uh, you have planted interest in robotics to all of us and that's a very good starting point for this workshop now i would like to invite dr vipin das to propose word of thanks sir hello Am yes sir you are audible yes sir you are audible okay uh, thank you so much uh, dr manipura and uh, uh, good morning uh, our chief guest uh, professor ashish datta and uh, director of triple uh, itdm karnool uh, professor dvl and somya jidu uh, dr j krishnaya head of mechanical engineering department triple itdm karnool all the faculty members and uh, all participants of this activity program so in fact uh, i consider this occasion as an honor and privilege to extend the vote of thanks of this activity program and be a part of this uh, this the program on robotics and so first of all i would like to thank our beloved director of triple uh, itdm karnool uh, professor dvln somya adil sir who, who informed all the faculty faculty members of triple itdm karnool about uh, submitting a activity proposal to other scheme and motivated all the faculty members of triple uh, itdm karnool uh, to submit a proposal to the uh, academy so in fact i would consider that this is the starting point, uh, starting point of all uh, all this epic program so in fact we submitted based on his advice and his suggestion and ultimately we uh, got funded a uh, five epic program under his advice so uh, we are extremely thankful for his uh, the continuous support and guidance from early stages of the planning and execution of this epic program so thank you so much uh, for sparing your precious time and motivating us to explore all aspects of academic fields and now i would like to thank uh, the chief guest of this program uh, professor uh, uh, he is the professor of department of mechanical engineering uh, iit kanpur uh, for accepting our request and uh, be a part of this program as uh, chief guest and giving an inaugural session on introduction to robotics and uh, artificial intelligence so even though it was an introductory session uh, it was really interesting and gave an insight on how we are connected uh, with the robotics in nowadays so this is really a good starting point for this activity program and it has given the equipment has given the, all the participants how we are uh, connected with that in the robotics and we have to go along with uh, the robotics and artificial all of coming in future days so thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful wonderful inaugural session and now i would like to thank uh, dr j krishnaya head of mechanical engineering department uh, of flight team karnool whose continuous guidance uh, support and motivation in realizing this program so thank you so much for all your support and uh, we expect uh, your mentoring throughout this activity program and we successfully finish this uh, activity program uh, 
participation. So finally, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Man, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Applied and Tahu, who has been behind this program for the past two months. So in fact, he uh, of course will do and and now I am confident that Dr. Nightbrakas has put enough effort in finalizing the course and course in this area. So thank you so much for all your for arranging this productivity uh, program. And now I would like to thank uh, the AICT uh, Training and the Learning Academy, that is Adel Academy, for considering our proposal and extending full financial support to conduct this activity. So, in fact, uh, one of the main bottlenecks to conduct any program is to want to be the financial actor for conducting the workshop. So, we are extremely thankful to the Adal uh, Academy for 100% uh, financial support for this uh, program. And last but not uh, uh, least, uh, I would like to thank all the participants who have shown interest in this program. And without you people, this program couldn't have uh, taken place. I am really confident that this FTP program will be very useful for the research scholars and the faculties who are working in the area of robotics and control and artificial intelligence. And finally, I would like to thank all the stakeholders uh, who are directly or indirectly involved in this workshop, and that is ultimately will result in the successful uh, completion of this uh, FTP program. So once again, uh, I, I am welcoming all the participants, and I hope that this FTP program is very successful and useful for all the all the participants of this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And wishing you all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we come to the end of this session. Um, let's conclude this session with um, national anthem. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. yeah, bye. We'll see in the uh, next session. Thank you. We'll end it.